Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, kids of all ages, it's time for the big show. Please give a nice, huge round of applause for the man of the nights, Graham Elwood! Sorry, I'm a big germaphobe. I don't know where that guy's been. Um, <laughs> Yeah, when the pandemic first hit, a friend of mine always makes fun of me. He's like, oh, Graham, you germaphobes, you must be freaking out. I was like, no, this is our finest moment. <laughs> Just shine it down. <laughs> so nice to be here. Thank you, uh, Chicago, for coming out tonight. <laughs> Glad to be out performing again, you know? It's been a crazy, it's been a crazy couple of years, COVID, I think, right? You know, we all went a little nuts during COVID, we all went a little nuts, it's okay. We all, some people went more nuts than others, you know? Heard some crazy shit, like masks don't work. Really? All right, have your dentist cough into your mouth. <laughs> Get yourself a freedom flu, you know what I mean? That'll be fun. <laughs> Last year when the vaccine came out, there's a lot of debate over it, which is good. I mean, we should, you know, have questions about the vaccine. I get it, you know? But I see all these comedians that I've known for years on social media, like, I'm not putting that into my body. I worked with you in Vegas in the 90s. <laughs> I saw you do blow off a stripper's ass, okay? <laughs> you can handle a little Moderna, you know what I'm saying? You having a comedy club pizza? Yeah, you can handle, <laughs> trust me. It's funny too to see how things change, you know? I remember when it first hit America, everybody was working together. Remember? Oh, we gotta protect the most vulnerable, you know? And, uh, thank you, frontline workers. And we all banged our pots and pans at eight o'clock for the medical staff. Remember that? That was like, oh, that lasted three months. <laughs> I'm reminded of World War II, where the Nazis bombed England every day for three years. <laughs> And the British every day, like air raid sirens, like just hellfire from above, boom, 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 boom. Every day the Brits were just like, stiff up a lip, carry on. <laughs> America's like, I can't get a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> I learned a lot, you know, especially when the shutdown first happened. I'm single, living alone, and I learned during that time that when I complained to my friends that were married with kids about how lonely and isolated I felt, they didn't give a shit at all. <laughs> they didn't care at all. <laughs> oh, is it so hard oh, being alone in your apartment? You don't have your spouse and your kids crawling up your ass every day? <laughs> My kid was late to Zoom school. How the hell does that happen? <laughs> oh, he just felt alone, went on a bike ride alone. <laughs> I wish I was alone in my apartment crying in the dark. At least it would have been quiet. <laughs> oh, thanks. I guess I'll just rewrite my suicide note. <laughs> Appreciate your support. <laughs> Dating during the pandemic's been hard, right? Any single people here tonight? Woo! Woo! See, <laughs> three. <laughs> Before the pandemic, half the crowd would be like, woo, I'm single! <laughs> the quarantine hit and everybody just paired up and the music stopped and I didn't have a chair, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> but, you know, you tell you, the few handful of single people that are here, I'm sure when you, you know, talk to your friends that are married with kids about, oh, it's hard to meet someone. Do they always tell you this bullshit? Like, you just gotta love yourself. <laughs> Fall in love with Graham, you know? <laughs> Take Graham out on a date. That's a great idea, you know. <laughs> if I could suck my own dick. But anyway. <laughs> uh, I mean, I do yoga, but I'm trying like I can't. <laughs> also, be, I'll be honest, you know, having some trust issues because like any good professional comedian a couple years ago had a horrifying breakup. And thank you so much. And <laughs> yeah, that was, that was gnarly, man. I was with this person for two and a half years. We lived together. Everything was going great. And then it just went, just went nuts. Like, 
I don't know what happens. Has that ever happened to you? Like, oh, you think that everything's going great, and then just bam, you're in the middle of a pink song? Like, <laughs> I don't know what happened. And I don't, you know, I don't drink. I'm completely sober. And she's like, oh, Graham, I love that you don't drink. You're the best boyfriend ever. And then the last two months, she just went off the rails. Like, went nuts. And a friend of mine, she goes, well, Graham, you know, she was a woman in her 20s. She was a lot younger. That's what happens. I was like, what do you mean? Is this like a thing that, like, <laughs> Every woman in their 20s does this. I didn't, I mean, I did some dumb shit in my 20s, but I wasn't like that much of a train wreck, you know? Is that a thing? Like every girl, that, every, yeah, every girl in her 20s blows up a two and a half year relationship by becoming a violent coke whore. <laughs> <laughs> if your boyfriend didn't get a restraining order against you, you weren't living. <laughs> And I know some of you think, oh, Graham, you know, you probably picked it. No, I, I, I get that there's guys out there that deliberately date some girl that's obviously a train wreck, and then when she goes nuts, they act shocked. I wasn't one of those dudes that's like, I was dating this stripper with a coke problem, and she just went nuts. Like, who saw that coming? <laughs> yeah, she just went off the rails. Here's something I've, you know, kind of a sidebar, uh, never heard anybody say before is, you know, once I started doing cocaine, my life got better. <laughs> You know what I mean? Everything kind of evened out, you know what I'm saying? Better group of friends, the cocaine crowd, good solid people, you know? <laughs> Dependable, on time. No trouble with the law at all, just don't look at me right now. <laughs> Another thing that makes dating hard is uh, my, where I'm at politically. Um, many of you watch my YouTube show, Woo! Political Vigilante, yeah. right on. <laughs> Thank you. I have another show, Government Secrets. Those are, thank you, thank you. For those of you who don't know, they're just kind of fun, sort of loosey-goosey shows, kind of talk about how the deep state killed Kennedy. You know, just fun, sort of. Trump and the Clintons, I have ties to Epstein. You know, just kind of fun, silly, sort of. The world's run by a global sex trafficking billionaire pedophile ring. But other than that, it's sort of a, sort of a spring break rom-com kind of a fun. <laughs> So yeah, it's, I, you know, people are like, are you on the apps? No, I'm not on the apps. They don't have a box to check for when they're like, what's, what's your political when you're filling out the profile? They don't have one that's anti-war, pro-labor socialist. They don't have that. <laughs> and when you do show somebody in the back, going, woo, yeah, there's one of us. Just woo, in the back. Can't pay your bills because you're an activist. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> and when, <laughs> thank you. And when, <laughs> When you do shows like Political Vigilante and Government Secrets, even when I, if I do go on a date, it's just hard. I'm too, I'm too judgmental, you know? I'll be like, oh, what do you do for a living? Oh, I work in the marketing department at Google. Oh, that's cool. They've just been doing data collection for the intelligence community for 2011, but whatever. <laughs> Thanks for being part of the problem. This date's over. Check, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, when you have a show called uh, Political Vigilante and government secrets, people send you crazy shit in the mail. <laughs> like crazy. I've always had a, a P.O. box on my website, and I saw the difference. And to be fair, I've gotten some wonderful letters from people like, Graham, I love your show. It got me through a tough time. Or you opened my eyes up to something that the regular people aren't regular media is not talking about. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. And to see the difference, I remember when I used to do a podcast called Comedy Film Nerds. And... <laughs> That's why we don't do it anymore, because uh, <laughs> six people listen. But thank you so much, nerds. Um, but <laughs> it was a fun show. It was very just nerdy. We just nerded out about movies. We loved doing it. So people would send me these kind of fun books when we did comedy film nerds, like Star Wars trivia, and hey, Graham, I, I live in Pittsburgh. Here's a book of all the cool movies shot in Pittsburgh. I go, oh, that's awesome. And now that I'm doing all this political stuff, I just get books like Sesame Street and the CIA. <laughs> How Kermit the Frog and Miss Piggy ran a honey trap in El Salvador. <laughs> it's cool doing the, doing the, the podcast stuff because I have, I have fans of all different walks of life, all different age groups. I mean, from teenagers all the way up to people in their 80s, people from all over the country and all over the world. It's really amazing. And so when I see, uh, like, people in my age group or older, like, get mad. Oh, the millennials and the Gen Z. I'm like, come on. They're always like, they're looking for their avocado toast and their... <laughs> participation medals or whatever, like. First of all, who raised them? Um, <laughs> like, they didn't raise themselves, they didn't just come out. 
And then the other thing, and here's what you say. Anybody young tonight, it's like in your 20s or 30s, and, and when you hear that shit, like, <laughs> here's what you say, like, oh, yeah, it's so awesome being young in America. It's so great. Can't afford college. If we do go to college, I got crushing student loan debt. Can't afford a house. We're afraid to have kids because of climate collapse. There's no good jobs out there. We can't afford health care. The only jobs are like, oh, we have to have three jobs delivering food and working for Uber. If we do get a good job, it's with some Silicon Valley billionaire asshole with venture capitalist money creating bullshit. No, or, or the Silicon Valley, or those billionaires, they're creating cool stuff to end homelessness and stop climate collapse. No, it's always some stupid, like, cat food home delivery app. <laughs> cat snack, cat app. Meow, 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 cat, meow, 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 snack. <laughs> So I, like I said, I grew up here, but I, I, I live in Los Angeles now. And uh, when you come from the Midwest and you move to LA, there's a lot of cool stuff about California, but they have a, there's some stuff you're like, what? Come on, no one would <laughs> ever talk that way in a million years. But so <laughs> I'll give you a, a statistic you might not be aware of. Los Angeles has the highest percentage of people per capita that use the following sentence 100% seriously. Just manifest it. <laughs> All the time, just manifest it. You can take a chakra crystal and think it. You can make anything happen. <laughs> just make it believe, like, wow, there's all these white ladies with special powers. It's amazing. <laughs> Holy shit. I'm like, look, I'm all for thinking positive, but let's be honest, there's a lot of first world privilege in the manifesting. <laughs> The home, it's not like, oh, the homeless should just manifest not living in late stage capitalism <laughs> and manifest moving to Beverly Hills. <laughs> so I did that joke in LA recently, and after the show, this woman came up to me and she was a manifester. <laughs> she was all like, look, Graham, you know, it works, and I'm telling you, I don't care. You know, she was all fired up. Some white lady with a Hindu name for Karen or whatever. <laughs> She's just like, you know, Grand Manifesting works. I mean, I did it. That's how I manifested having my own clothing store. Oh, the one your parents helped you with. <laughs> That's what I forgot to do. Manifest a trust fund. Okay. <laughs> but she wouldn't let it go. She's like, well, look at you, Graham. You manifested being a professional comedian. And I was like, all right, I'll give you that. Yes, I did. I've worked long and hard. I started at this Club Zanies. It's why it's amazing that I'm here. I mean, <laughs> yes, right? After the show, you can go back there and see my picture on the wall when I'm 22. I have a vest over a t-shirt. Uh, and thankfully, you, it's just from the waist up so you can't see my acid wash jeans. But anyway, the 90s were a complicated time, you guys. It was a complicated time for everybody. But no, that's... <laughs> That's why being, you know, yes, I, I've worked long and hard, and that's why I wanted to shoot my special at this club, because as I'm from Chicago, and this, this is one of the first places that ever worked me, and this club is over 40 years old. It's an amazing club. It used to be a strip club run by the mob, so it's like, <laughs> there's probably a mob hit here. You know, it's got that vibe, you know what I mean? <laughs> but I said to this woman, I said, you're right, you're right. I did manifest becoming a professional comedian, but let's be honest, folks. I'm lucky I live in a country where this is even a job. Right? Come on. It's... Third world countries, you don't get to just pick jobs and make up some crazy career. There's not a guy in Yemen right now going, this horrifying proxy war between Iran and the evil American empire at the behest of the brutal kingdom of Saudi Arabia, causing the worst humanitarian crisis the world has ever known. But I'm sure it will end once Mercury gets out of retrograde. <laughs> Then I will manifest my vision board dream of owning my own Pilates studio. <laughs> Hashtag blessed. <laughs> so I had a college professor father, and anyone who's had college professor parents knows that when you're a kid, everything is a learning experience. <laughs> 
This was never more evident than when my family, I'm the youngest of four, we lived in Germany for a year. My father had a Fulbright, which is a research scholarship, and his PhD was in German theater history. And yes, that's a lot of fun when you're a kid. <laughs> learning about Goethe and Bertolt Brecht. Those guys were a riot. <laughs> my friends were going to amusement parks. I was learning about German existentialism. <laughs> Living in Germany in the 70s was a blast, too, because it was only 30 years after World War II, so the German kids fucking hated us. <laughs> and it was a just unreal. It was like, oh, man, the Germans are mean. And, ah, you know, no fun happening. Well, actually, that's not, I shouldn't be, that's stereotypical. That's stereotypical. Because we all know the name of that very famous German comedian. <laughs> yeah, there isn't one, folks. <laughs> There wasn't one, there never has been one, there never will be one. It's not happening. No such thing. So the entire year we lived in Germany, all we did was go to museums and castles. I'm like, doesn't this country have a water park or some shit? So one of the field trips, the educational field trips my dad took us on was we all went to Dachau. That's a concentration camp, folks. Here was the age breakdown. My oldest sister was 14, so it's, all right, it's probably the age you should start learning about the Holocaust and you know the realities of the world. Uh, my other sister was 11, okay. My brother was nine, that's too young. I was six! <laughs> I brought this up to my dad a couple years ago. I said, like, don't you think six was a little young, Dad? And all he said was, well, I guess we didn't really think that through. Like, <laughs> I became jaded early on. <laughs> when we moved back to the States, the first day in school, and again, I'm like in the second grade, the teacher's going around the classroom, like, what did everybody do on their summer vacation? <laughs> <laughs> like, Timmy, what did you do? Oh, my dad and my brother and I, we built a go-kart. Oh, <laughs> Susie, what did you do? Oh, I learned how to make a campfire in the Girl Scouts. <laughs> Graham, what did you do? I went to a death camp. <laughs> I don't trust the human race. <laughs> There's no God. <laughs> well, why don't you just make that into some macaroni art for show and tell? <laughs> Maybe like a turkey hand that just says, There's no God can do different crayons for each one. <laughs> so I have this dark view of the world. And it, ha it happens every day, you know. People will come to me, oh, Graham, you must be a comedian. You're a comedian, you must watch a lot of funny movies and TV shows. <laughs> nope. I watch documentaries about cults. <laughs> Those are amazing, you guys. Here's why you gotta watch cult documentaries. If you're ever having a bad day, <laughs> maybe beating yourself up over some decisions you made, I can assure you, you've never done something as dumb as join a cult. <laughs> Halfway through every cult doc, I'm like, how stupid are these people? <laughs> it's always so obvious. I mean, I, all right, it starts with noble intentions, right? It's a bunch of hippies. We're gonna live off the grid and grow our own food and make our own clothing and no more capitalism, no more war. It's like, oh yeah, that sounds great. But then there's these obvious red flags, <laughs> like matching outfits. <laughs> Come on. Like, let's say you two guys who are here cheating on your wives together. <laughs> If you showed up late and walked in and I was wearing a robe with a sash and the whole crowd was wearing a matching robe, you'd be like, oh, where's the comedy show? Not the cult rally. <laughs> we just, is that next door? The comedy's like, okay, great, 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 great. The leaders of the cults always have crazy eyes and jacked up haircuts. It's so obvious, there's this one on HBO, this woman, Gwen, she's got this huge like tidal wave blonde hair. And she's like, Jesus wants you to give me $10,000 to lose weight. <laughs> it's so obvious. But even years later, the people are being interviewed 
still sounds so dumb and clueless. <laughs> They're always like, well, you know, one day we were all doing yoga and the prophet walked in and he stuck his thumb in my butt. <laughs> And I thought, this is kind of weird. <laughs> and then he said, the second knuckle brings enlightenment. <laughs> so I mean, who could have known? Everyone <laughs> knew. So we gotta come to grips with the fact that we all grew up in America, which is a cult. America's a cult, guys. We have to admit we're a cult. We have to admit we're, we're really... I used to think America's the greatest country in the world. It's not perfect, but no, it's a cult. We're not number one in any good category at all. You know what I mean? We're the only categories we're good in are bad. Like we're number one in prison population, number one in gun deaths, number one in infant mortality amongst Western nations. We're number one in military spending. Like. Yeah, exactly. But the categories we should be number one, like infrastructure, I just looked it up today. We're 13th. Oh. We're number 13. <laughs> We're number 13. Take that, Denmark, you 14th place sock holes. Like, eh. eat it. <laughs> so America, you know, we've got all these little cults within us. Our two political, both our political parties are cults. Our religions are most of them cults, you know. All of them, I would say. All, yeah. <laughs> this is why I love my fucking YouTube podcast fans, because they don't heckle. They just bring up political clarifications that shows. <laughs> Actually, most of them, if you look into it by definition. Um, I love it. They, I don't want to get heckled at these shows. It's just like, Graham, actually, that ballot measure passed by two thirds vote. Like, oh. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, but that's why comedians, we'd never fall for cults. You've never heard of a professional comic getting roped into a cult, because we have been in the back of classrooms since we were kids going, this is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> comedians don't fall for cults. Comedians and black people. Black people don't fall for cults. <laughs> right? They're always like, what the fuck? There's no way. <laughs> Although I did that joke recently, and a black woman yelled out, the Baptist church. And I was like, oh yeah, that's black people cult. Okay, cool. <laughs> I get it. Now, don't get offended, folks. I, I know all about religious cults. I was raised Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest cult on the planet. <laughs> so we have to understand America is a cult, right? We've got all these little cults within us, you know, like Florida. <laughs> Florida's a cult. I don't know what is happening in Florida. I don't know what they're doing down there. I'm going to read you an actual story because I follow on the Reddit, there's a Reddit page called The Florida Man, so it's amazing. This is an actual story. I am not making this up. You can look this up online. This is not, I'm not exaggerating this at all. This is a real title, and I clicked on it. Nude beach blowjob jet ski fight. <laughs> Leads to wife's death. <laughs> What's going on, Florida? What are you doing? Florida! And I feel like if somebody came from another country and didn't know anything about America and just had an iPhone and said, hey, Siri, what's Florida? <laughs> Siri would just be like, nude beach, blowjob, jet ski fight, <laughs> coupon book, clan rally, park hopper pass, kids eat free, alligator flip flop, casino, glow in the dark, sun visor, bingo, AARP discount, beach volleyball, red lobster, neon airboat, strip club, orange juice, gun show, college football, affordable senior living, Hooters, three t-shirts for $10, all you can eat, oxy cotton, spring break, burn notice, swamp tour. Thank you, Siri. Like, <laughs> and I don't know if it's the people that grew up there, because I know so I've been I've performed in Florida a bunch. I've had great shows there, and I've I've met people that grew up there. They, they seem smart, sharp people. Although my ex is from there. Oh God, I should have known. Fuck. <laughs> she had a pentagram tattoo and a drug problem. Anyway, I, <laughs> I made a mistake. Um, <laughs> but that aside, um, I think the <laughs> I've met a lot of people from Florida, and they seem pretty sharp. I think what happens. Florida attracts every like American that's run out of options. 
When you're in Florida, ask them who moved there. Go, why did you move? Not, I mean, obviously, the, you know, we went to retire. Not the retirees. That's a different thing. But just the people who moved there in the middle of their lives, there's always some shady reason why. <laughs> Nowhere else in America has this. You ask anyone, why'd you move to Chicago? Oh, my wife got a new job. Or we moved to Dallas to be closer to my parents. It's like, why'd you move to Florida? Ah, you know, the courts up in Massachusetts. <laughs> or... oh. oh, it's the courts, is it? Oh, okay, yeah. That's why you're renting out jet skis and dealing oxy on the side. It's an all-cash business under a fake name. Got it, yeah, yeah, it's the courts. They really... Total court thing. <laughs> so we have to come to grips with the fact that America is the Florida of Earth. <laughs> I got friends all over the world. I was just in Europe for two, two and a half weeks. I went to six different countries, and all I heard was, what's fucking wrong with you guys over there? <laughs> what are you guys doing? And in all fairness, we have to come to grips with the fact that maybe the human race, like, maybe Earth is the Florida of the galaxy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Why do you think these UFOs, they never land? <laughs> they never, they just fly by. Why can't a UFO just land and get out of the spaceship? Well, hi, we're from another planet. You guys from Earth? It's nice. They're terrified of us. <laughs> And I think this is my theory. I think UFOs are actually alien teenagers borrowing their parents' spaceship. <laughs> their parents are like, you, do, you can use your father's spaceship, but do not go to Earth, okay? <laughs> your uncle went there in the 50s. He's been in Area 51. They've been sticking stuff in his ass ever since. <laughs> do not go. No, no, we're just gonna go to Chad's and do homework. <laughs> well, there's these alien teenagers, you know? And there's like a younger brother in the back who's never been to Earth, and they're like, we gotta go to Earth! <laughs> but mom said we should. No, dude, it's awesome. You gotta watch these people. They're out of their minds. <laughs> they kill each other over money and oil and religion. They're out of their fucking minds. <laughs> they draw lines in a map and go, that's your country, this is mine, and then fucking kill each other and fight over that shit. <laughs> They need breathable air and drinkable water to survive, but they poison it for money. It's fucking stupid. <laughs> they worship billionaires. What's a billionaire? Just rich assholes that fuck everybody over. They're so goddamn fucking stupid. They're so, we gotta see this shit, but yo, they got the best weed. <laughs> so yeah, I wanna, you know, I wanna have faith that America and the world can fix its shit. I wanna have faith that we can fix stuff, you know? I, I have, uh, you know, I just want things equal. I like equality. That's why I don't, you know, Woo! Yeah. thank you so much, right? Just equal. Like the idea of what America was supposed to be, right? Equal representation. I mean, aside from the genocide and the slavery. But other than that, <laughs> just want things equal. But I see little, there's little glimpses of hope, you know? I mean, the, the Black Lives Matter, that's been good for people, black people getting, uh, you know, ending systemic racism. All these young people out there unionizing. There's been over 200 Starbucks unionized. Like that's, imp that's good labor, you know? Women are getting equal rights, that's amazing. It's bullshit that anyone should tell them what they could do with their fucking rights and bodies. That's fucking nonsense. Come on. Every guy here, if a bunch of women told us what to do with our dicks, we'd be like, fuck that. I mean, I know there's some married guys who are like, well, my wife's got my dick in a jar, but that's, that's not a legal thing. That's not such a choice. So I'm all for equality. I just want it to be equal. But I must say this. There are some women out there, not a lot, some, some of these feminists who just want equality for the good shit. Oh, it got quiet, did it? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. There's just a certain type. We'll just call them, I don't know, Hillary supporters. Anyway, um, <laughs> and you know, because I've never seen this. I've never seen like Deborah Messing or one of those big celebrity feminists like it's protesting like I, it's, I'm so tired that I have to get a new good paying job in this nice air conditioned office when what I really want to do is work on a garbage truck. <laughs> it's not fair that guys get to work in garbage and 90% of all workplace deaths are men. That's bullshit. <laughs> More men are in prison. That's unfair. More men are homeless. That's bullshit. We got to do something about that. <laughs> men have a higher suicide rate. Come on, ladies. We got to even that shit up. <laughs> 
patriarchy, you know? <laughs> so when Russia invaded the Ukraine, it's gonna get dark, folks. Buckle the fuck up. <laughs> I'm glad you guys are down, because for those of you who are like, huh, just don't ever take your kids to Dachau. Anyway, because um, this is what happens. So when Putin invaded the Ukraine, Ukrainian President Zelensky ordered all men under the age of 60 to stay and fight. Women and children could leave, men had to stay. Even men that were like, yo, I make shoes. They're like, here's a machine gun. You make war now, bitch. Like, I didn't see any of these women on social media like President Zelensky's a sexist. It's toxic masculinity. Women should be allowed. <laughs> Women should be allowed to fight in a bullshit proxy war for money, just like men. Yes. Come on, ladies, we're all flying to the Ukraine with our pussy hats to fight the Russian army. <laughs> yeah, I didn't see that online, I didn't see that. So yeah, I don't, I don't like, you know, I'm against all war. I don't like what Putin is doing. I don't like it, I'm against war, be main reason, because, uh, I have been to Iraq and Afghanistan to entertain the United States military. If there's any military or vets here tonight, give them a round of applause, folks. You know, we have an all-volunteer military because of economic conscription, so I've seen, you know, <laughs> it's true. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've seen, you know, I've been on a, I don't know what real combat is like, and I'll never know. Uh, but I've seen more war than most civilians have. I've been on a helicopter in Afghanistan that came under fire. I had a rocket attack in Iraq. I've seen way too many uh, wounded service members and civilians, and so I'm just against war. I'm just against it. I'm done with it. I don't want to see that shit anymore. Yeah. So I get a little pissed off when I see politicians in both parties and our media getting this selective outrage, like, whoa, Putin's committing war crimes. Okay, we should hold him accountable, but I don't know, uh, has he been bombing the Middle East for the last 20 fucking years? No, I don't think he did, right? <laughs> like, you know, it's, 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 it's like we're all get all, and you see these celebrities at Hollywood award shows, like, I stand with the people of Ukraine. The people of Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, Syria, Palestine, Somalia, I can't really stand for them, I got a bad back, my knee's a little <laughs> tweaky, you know? <laughs> And it's so hypocritical, man. I can't, I can't watch it. I can't, we, we've, we've spent, you know, look at Afghanistan. In 20 years, four presidents from both political parties spent $3.5 trillion to replace the Taliban with the Taliban. <laughs> <laughs> the fuck was that for? The big winners were the Taliban and defense contractors. Like, yeah, all right. Meanwhile, we're number 13 in infrastructure. We're number 13. So I just get, we're so hypocritical, man. When I hear the politicians and the people in the media say this without acknowledging what we do, it's literally like a drug addict with face tattoos running a meth lab out of a preschool, walking into a bar going, you guys drink too much. <laughs> <laughs> and it's always like, you know, we, endless spending on war. Anytime we want something good, like how, we, we need Medicare for all. We need free insur health insurance like they've had in Europe for 80 years. <laughs> But then we're always told, how are you gonna pay for it? Like, I don't know, the same way you pay for all these wars and Wall Street bailouts. Like, how about that? Like, they never run out of money for those assholes. It's like, when the Mississippi water thing happened, the governor of Mississippi said, we need roughly $3 billion to fix our water. On that same day, we spent another $3 billion to Ukraine. We sent over $70 billion thus far. And I'm like, wow, America is the worst roommate ever. <laughs> The American people, they're like the good roommate. You know, pay your bills on time. Like, hey, I borrowed your car, I returned it, I washed it and filled up the tank. And the United States government, with both of these parties, doesn't matter who's in charge, they're the worst roommate ever. It's like the good roommate comes in, hey man, did you see that envelope? Remember I put that envelope and I put $3 billion in there and it said to fix uh, Mississippi's water and I said, just don't spend it on anything else. It's, do you know where, it, it's gone. I don't see where it is. Oh, fuck, dude, that was yours? Oh, man. <laughs> Dude, we took that and we went to Vegas. Ah. <laughs> and then this guy Zelensky came up and we gave it to him and he started shooting like, you wasted that money in Vegas? Dude, the dice got cold. Don't blame the messenger. Like. <laughs> Here's how you end war. 
Get everybody in Congress and the Senate, get every uh, CEO of every defense contractor, everybody in the White House, the vice president, the president, regardless if it's Democrat, Republican, whoever's there, the entire cabinet, all of the CEOs of the oil companies and the CEOs of the banks that profit from war, have all of their children have to go to war. Yeah, when rich kids go to war, instead of working class kids, that's when war will end, I guarantee you. I guarantee you, you know what I mean? With like some rich, you know, just like, oh, Ivanka Trump and Hunter Biden are neck deep in the shit in Kiev. <laughs> I bet you war is gonna end. When Chelsea Clinton and Donald Trump Jr. are drafted for Marine Corps boot camp, <laughs> that's when mommy and daddy are gonna get a call like, oh, we gotta end war. All right, pumpkin, as soon as we leave Epstein's Island, we'll come there. <laughs> So I think we all need to travel more, as especially as Americans, because how, one of the things you notice with cults, they isolate their members, right? They keep them isolated from the outside. In America, we're isolated. We only share a border with two countries. I was just in Europe. I hit six countries in 15 days, all these different cultures and people and everything. We need to get out there and travel, right? See the world, see what's out there. Get out of your comfort zone, man. Meet other people from, in, go to a country you don't speak the language. I've been to Russia, I went there in 2019, and a friend of mine who's Russian told me, I don't speak any Russian. It's like, just put a ski at the end of every word. <laughs> so I was in a coffee shop. There was a little cooler of pre-made sandwiches and they had stickers on them, but it was all in Russian. And I don't know what it said at all. So I called this woman over that worked there. She didn't speak any English. I just called her over and I pointed at the sandwiches and I went, cause I'm a vegetarian. I went, vegetarianski? <laughs> And she went, ah, oh, da, and then picked out the sandwich. We figured it out. Our governments don't get along, but she got me a vegetarian sandwich at the Starbucks ski or wherever I was at. We figured it out, man. Get out there, meet people. Because it doesn't listen to what the governments say. Like, I did a whole tour through China and Japan, right? It was amazing. And you learn stuff about different cultures. Like, when you fly in a major airline from an American city to, a, to another city in another country, those, those big airlines do a very good job of making announcements in English, right? But I then went from Hong Kong to do a show in Guangzhou, China. And I flew there like Spirit Airlines. <laughs> it was like, I don't know, Dragonfoot Airlines or some shit like that. <laughs> and so when the plane lands, I'm the only Westerner that has probably ever been on that flight. <laughs> so when it lands, they make an announcement in Mandarin, then Cantonese, then I don't know, it sounded like, like Korean, Japanese, Sanskrit, I don't know. <laughs> By the time they got to English, they didn't give a shit if it made sense. <laughs> it was just like, with kindest request of the pleasantries for the travelments of your disembarkation for your passporting. <laughs> so stay, stay, stay seated, stay seated. Stay. <laughs> oh, 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 passport, passport, passport. <laughs> So the whole trip was me just going, oh, okay. So the whole trip was like that, but I learned and, and people laughed and we got to know each other and we spoke four words to me, it was awesome, right? I learned all this cultural stuff. Like when I was going to Hong Kong, a comedian friend of mine said, in Hong Kong, they, you can get a hand tailored silk suit for like two, $300. That's a two, $3,000 suit in the States. I'm like, awesome. And all the street merchants in Hong Kong know this. So when they see a Western man walking down the street, they come at you and they have this hand gesture that I was not familiar with. So in America, when we call someone over, we do this, right? We go, hey, yo, yo, come here, come here. I'm uh, doing a show with chakra crystals in a strip club that used to be run by the mob. <laughs> so in, in China and large portions of Asia, they, they do this hand gesture. This means call you over. So I didn't know that, right? So the guy's, he's like, ah, you want silk suit? And I thought he was like, get the fuck out. You know what I mean? <laughs> I was like, shit, my bad. I didn't vote for him. You know, I vote third party. Like, <laughs> And these guys hard sell you, man. He's like, ah, you want silk suit? You want fake Rolex? You want hashish? I'm like, this guy's got everything. <laughs> this is like a Walmart. This is amazing. <laughs> and then his store was teeny. It was like smaller than this stage. And he's like, I can get you anything you want. So I was being a you know, cocky American. I was gonna try to stump him. I'm like, okay, how about a unicorn? <laughs> yeah, 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 no problem. <laughs> he just took a carrot, glued it on a cat's head. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> So then I went to this outdoor market in Beijing and they had this wall of iPhone covers. 
And it was like all of the rejects, like all the stuff that doesn't get sold in America. They just unload it there because, you know, everything's made in China thanks to the Bushes and the Clintons. So anyway, everything's there. And they not, a lot of them didn't even make sense. Like one of them was trying to say, I heart the USA. And the heart was an outline of the continental United States, but it had stars and stripes on it. And I was looking at it like, I, America, the USA? <laughs> Like, I don't know, I wish I could show it to you guys, but it was for an iPhone 7. I have an iPhone 12, I'm not a fucking animal. Anyway. <laughs> so, I bought it as a joke, but you know if some redneck saw it, they'd be like, you're goddamn right, America the USA. <laughs> if you don't America the USA, then why don't you move to North Korea, you son of a bitch, <laughs> get her done, you know? And then on this tour, I went to Tokyo, Japan. And Tokyo is a fantastic city. It's about twice the size of Manhattan. And they are the nicest, most polite people ever. It is a clean, well-run city. Everything is just like, oh, arigato gozaimasu. They bow. I'll give you a great example. I was in a 7-Eleven in downtown Tokyo in the middle of a busy workday. There's this long line of people coming in, getting something quick to eat on their lunch break. And this is how the woman gave change to every single person. She had a tray. Uh, change, receipt, bowed, and said in Japanese, thank you so much for coming into our store. We appreciate your business. And everyone reciprocated. People weren't just like, yeah, yeah, whatever. They were like, oh, thank you. So and it was so beautiful. I was frozen at how gorgeous this was. And then this Japanese man kind of accidentally cut in front of me. And when I pointed out to him, I'm like, oh, excuse me, he was mortified. He's like, oh, I'm so sorry, so sorry. And I started thinking, could you imagine this shit in New York City? <laughs> Being at like a 7-Eleven, you know what I mean? Bodega in New York City, some big New Yorker guy cuts in front of you, excuse me. Oh, my fucking bad. I'm so sorry, we love tourists in the Big Apple. Perhaps I should commit seppuku, ritual suicide, to regain my family's honor. Go Jets. See, the other thing I did when I was in Japan, and I've started to do this anytime I travel internationally, and please do this. I started watching their news, because you get a totally different view. And I started watching uh, NHK, which is basically like Japan's CNN. There's an English version. You can get it online. I highly recommend watching it. Because when I first saw it, it kind of threw me off, because they do this weird thing. It's called um, journalism. Uh, yeah. Crazy. They just talk about the news and facts and information. It's nuts. There's not like a Japanese flag waving. And then that fear ticker like we have in American media, you know, that is ISIS and your kids' chocolate milk, you know. <laughs> There's this old Japanese guy doing primetime news with a weird ear. I'm like, he would never be on TV in America. Ever. Ever. It was, it was like, wow. And I just, because American media is so bad. I don't care what you watch. MSNBC, Fox, CNN, ABC, it doesn't matter. Our media is designed to keep us all divided, distracted, and afraid. Right? Yep. They want us fighting red, blue, black, white, male, female, boomer, Gen Z, whatever. They want us fighting about whatever, man. They're always distracting us with some shit, like while they're passing some awful bill, like, oh my God, Kanye West said something crazy. Like, no way. <laughs> Everything, every story, it's always, it's always like a, a fear angle, you know what I mean? And our, our journalists, they're, they're not journalists. They're infotainers. Right. <laughs> they're these beautiful actors. They have that fake laugh, you know, that they do between stories, that segue laugh. Looks like it's gonna be a wet weekend, huh, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not too wet for the big ball game, right, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> Every story has a fear angle, right? Everyone has a fear angle. What you need to know about your children and sprinklers. <laughs> Summertime backyard fun or aquatic death tool. Like, <laughs> sprinklers are killing kids? No way! <laughs> My favorite thing that the media does in America, they'll take whatever the story of the days we should all be paying attention to, and they put it next to the dumbest story ever. <laughs> New UN report says America and the world needs to be off of fossil fuels by 2030, otherwise climate change is imminent. But first, 
a Florida man whose bakery has gone to the dogs. <laughs> and then they show like a puppy with oven mitts on pushing a cake tin into a stove. Those look like some doggone good muffins, huh, Bob? <laughs> you are so right. Every winter they do this story, every winter, and it's always breaking news, like, oh my God, a snowstorm hitting the East Coast in the winter. No way! Every winter it's like, who saw that coming? Blizzardzilla, snowpocalypse. There's always some guy in the streets like, Linda, I'm here in Times Square. There is frozen water coming down from the sky. Meteorologists are calling it snow. It's coming down in an aggressive warlike manner, probably sent here by Russia or China. So I start watching NHK. Watch it, because when I watch American media, I'm mad, I'm depressed, I'm like, we got no hope. When I watch NHK, they'll do these 20 minute human interest stories that just restore my faith in humanity. They're just beautiful. Like, we're gonna talk to a Kyoto woman about the ancient art of rice gazing. <laughs> rice gazing, like, oh shit, I'm in, let's do this, man. <laughs> Some stately Japanese woman comes out in a kimono. First, we find the perfect grain of rice. This takes up to 10 years. <laughs> then we pull a stone out of the river, we put the rice on the stone, and we let it sit and dry in the sun. Then we gaze upon it, <laughs> contemplating the impermanence of the universe in the Buddhist tradition, much as the shogunite have done for a thousand years. <laughs> Holy shit, this is awesome! <laughs> I'm like, have faith in humanity. This is so amazing. I love this. And meanwhile, on Fox News, our gay Mexican socialist murdering New York City with snow. Like, no, Fox News. <laughs> so the media, too, they kiss the billionaires' asses because these billionaires spend tens of million dollars of marketing money, right? Remember last summer when Jeff Bezos threw his cock rocket around the planet? And the media was like, this is amazing. He flew a rocket around the planet. Here's the actual flight, folks. It was four minutes long and barely penetrated the Earth's atmosphere. So I guess Bezos wanted the whole world to know what his girlfriend feels. <laughs> Comes off his rocket and they're all high-fiving him. This is amazing, look at Jim Bezos. That stupid cowboy hat. You know, he used taxpayer dollars to, the richest guy in the history of everything used our money to, fuel that stupid cock rocket. And then the, the, the journalist, that's no joke, man. And the journalist was like, oh, this opens the doorway for space tourism. This is an actual quote. Now for only $23 million, you can fly into outer space. Oh, 23 million, that's it? Oh shit, you guys take Venmo? Fuck yeah, let's do this. 23, oh great, that's all we need. Richard Branson has a rocket, like yeah, 23 million. So now rich assholes are gonna fly around a planet that's on fire that they have the money to fix, but they're too selfish and greedy to do it. Yeah! yeah. We gotta bring back bullying. Yeah. I'm telling you, not for kids necessarily, but for certain shithead adults. Like, we should send some meatheads to Silicon Valley. You know what I'm saying? Just send some just thugged out UFC guys like, hey, Bezos, that's my rocket now, Bezos. <laughs> Thanks, nerd. Just get him in a headlock. Hey, nerd. <laughs> You're gonna start paying your uh, employees union wages with good benefits, right, nerd? <laughs> You're gonna end homelessness, right, nerd? <laughs> the other story they kissed his ass about last summer, I don't know if you remember this, they're like, Jeff Bezos bought a new yacht, made a new yacht from scratch. It was so big, it needed a support yacht. <laughs> support yacht? Jesus Christ, what an asshole. <laughs> but I get it, you know what I mean? I mean, if you got a yacht that's big, you're gonna need a support yacht. I mean, we're, after all, where are the caviar and the supermodels gonna go? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I totally get it. Remember Betsy DeVos, Secretary of Education under Trump, had 10 yachts? I get it. You don't wanna have the same yacht in the Caribbean that you have in the south of France. You'll look like a fucking asshole, you know? <laughs> and you gotta get a yacht built from scratch. I mean, right? You wanna drive around in a used yacht? What are you, an animal? Okay. <laughs> 
used yacht, just saying it makes me want to vomit. It's like, oh, used diaper. Like, that's just fucking gross. It's just gross. Not too much? You guys like yachts? <laughs> I remember, too, though, that when it, like, all these rich guys are flying into space. I, I grew up in the 70s. I remember when the space program, it meant something. Like, the, NASA, we took the best of the best in America. Right, we took the we took the best men, the best women. We they, they, and the, the one percent, the top, the best scientists, the best fighter pilots, the best researchers. Now just two rich dicks can just fly around. What's the NBA finals gonna be? Just Mark Cuban and Mark Zuckerberg in a game of horse, like. <laughs> and it's so bad. These these you know these politicians. That's why. They control the parties, they control the media, they control everything, right? These billionaire assholes. That's why every four years we're stuck with voting for the lesser of two evils, yeah. right? Yeah. I go, I've, tr I've been to other countries, they'll have three, four, five political parties, coalition governments, they get shit done. We just, are, it's so bad, every four years, the lesser of two evils. It's at the last election, 330 million people in this country, the two best guys we could come up with. <laughs> Donald Trump and Joe Biden, the two best guys. We scoured the whole country and we got grab them by the pussy and sniffing little kid's hair. All right, awesome. Fantastic. Good Lord, who are we sending to the Olympics? There's nowhere else in America we would put up with this lesser of two evil shit, right? We're America. We want to be the best, right? We want to go to the. We want our kids to go to the best schools. We want to live in the best neighbor. We want to have the best jobs. We want our teams to win. We want to win the gold medals in the Olympics. We would never tolerate this. Imagine if advertisers tried this. The all-new Chevy Malibu, just not as shitty as a Ford Taurus. <laughs> Honey, it's date night. We need a sitter for the kids. There's only two babysitters to choose from: a pedophile and a meth head. I go meth head. You gotta go meth head, right? Yeah. Right? You gotta go meth head. <laughs> At least the kids will have activities, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, you might come home and one of them has a prison tattoo, but at least they did some shit. <laughs> so bad, these politicians. So bad. People like, will argue with me. Grant, there's a difference between the parties. Okay, I'll tell you the difference. Republicans would skull fuck a puppy to turn a nickel. <laughs> the Democrats will skull fuck a puppy and then put a rainbow flag on it. <laughs> and go, the diversity of puppy skull fucking. <laughs> Yay, inclusion. <laughs> don't bring your kids to Dachau, guys. I don't know what else to tell you. I don't know how else to break it down. Oh, these parties are so bad, you know? And I just, I get, I get like mad that incremental centrism, you know? They get into the Democrats, Joe Biden gets into power. He's like, oh, remember when he was running in 2020 in the summer? He was like, now's not the time for a revolution. <laughs> Where were you during the summer of 20? Riots, there's food lines, people lost their jobs. Yeah, that's right. Revolutions always happen when shits are going great. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Remember the civil rights movements? Because black people in the South were being treated so well. They were just like, this is great. And I shudder to think what would happen if these incremental centrists were around during like bold times in history when bold change needed to happen. You know, like FDR's famous speech, the only thing we have to fear is everything. It's too hard. We can't get it done. <laughs> Congress is a log jam, you know. JFK, we want to put a man on the moon by the end of the 60s, but I don't think it's possible. <laughs> Maybe in the 70s or 80s. I mean, how are we going to pay for it, you know? <laughs> These gutless leaders today, were like if Joe Biden and Pelosi were around in the civil rights movement, they would have been like, hey, Rosa Parks, don't move to the front of the bus. It's too performative. <laughs> it's a purity test. Why don't you do the middle of the bus? In fact, start at the back, move up one row at a time, wait a couple years, get bipartisan support. God damn it. 
That's why we need to smoke weed. And lead, weed needs to be legal in this country nationwide. I know some states have it, but it needs to be on a federal level. It needs to be completely decriminalized. Yep. There's no reason people should be in prison for smoking a plant. And I'm completely sober, you guys. I don't, I don't do any of that stuff. But I think this is why we need to you know, smoke weed. It's because, first of all, like when Trump was president, I think he would have been a president, better president if he would have smoked weed. <laughs> you know, instead he just sounded like a guy coked up at a party trying to rope you into a business deal. <laughs> it's like, you, know, you want to build a wall? Build a wall. Build a wall? <laughs> want to fucking buy Greenland? You want to buy Greenland, bro? Let's do it. I got Bitcoin. We'll fucking buy Greenland. It'll be awesome. Let's we'll start Space Force. Space Force, dude. Fucking Space Force. Wanna be Captain Captains? Let's fucking do it. We'll fly around, we'll bang green chicks like Captain Kirk fucking Spaceport. It's out of his mind. I remember when the, the, you know, the liberals wanted to impeach Trump. I was like, I'm glad that didn't happen because then we would have had President Mike Pence. Yeah, exactly. What would that have been? Just shock the gay out of people and outlaw lunch with women? <laughs> Remember when he said, I can't have lunch with my female subordinates? What happens at lunch, Mike? <laughs> Some woman sits down, hello, Mr. Vice President. <laughs> Look what you made me do. <laughs> How dare you bring your boobs to lunch? <laughs> People are out of their minds. <laughs> Like, if Trump would have smoked weed when he was president, he wouldn't have wanted to build a wall around Mexico. He would have just been down at the border going, we should start a music festival. <laughs> you know what I mean? Get Mexican-American bands just jamming together, fucking body painting, empanadas, be fucking sick. <laughs> if Biden smoked weed, he might, you know, remember where he is, or... <laughs> So it's like breaking news. Like, oh, that president finished a sentence today, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> ah, it's no big deal that the guy in charge of launch codes has clear cognitive decline. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> See, I made fun of both sides. If anyone's offended, I fucking took everybody out, so don't worry about it. <laughs> If you got offended because I made fun of your guy, you're in a cult. <laughs> and this is why I, I think weed should be legalized like nationwide, because I've been working in bars and nightclubs since I was 18 years old, which means two things. One, I have no marketable skills. <laughs> Thank you. Two, everything's a joke when you're a comedian. <laughs> I spend two hours a night at the comedy club either making jokes on stage or backstage with the other comics. The other 22 hours out of the day, I am either sleeping or telling myself, don't make that joke, don't say that. <laughs> Cops don't find that funny. Don't... <laughs> Even in relationships, I'm like, I love you, I love you too, ha ha, tricked you. Like everything, <laughs> everything's a joke. And I like it too, because there's a lot of medical stuff. Like I'm, I'm, I like, you know, uh, holistic medicine, whatever, I tried that. Because I had a really bad, uh, several years ago, a really bad chronic hip and back pain. It got so bad that the whole left side of my body was tingling. And I called up my physician. I was like, hey doc, we should set up an appointment. And the left side of my body's like tingling and in pain. Do not ever say left and tingling to a physician. <laughs> Yeah, he lost his shit. He's like, oh my God, Graham, get yourself to a hospital. Do not drive yourself. Have a friend or get an ambulance. You could be having a stroke or a heart attack. You are on borrowed time. I'm like, thanks, bitch, damn. <laughs> my buddy's driving me to the, the hospital in LA. I'm flipping out. I'm like, well, dude, if I die, you get my surfboards. Like, I'm like, I'm like punching out. They run a bunch of tests on me. They're like, it's not a stroke or a heart attack. We don't know what it is, so we're gonna order an MRI. Okay, I'd never had an MRI at that point. The technician goes, here's a couple earplugs. It's about an hour and 15 minutes. Just try to sleep through it. Yeah, that's like, exactly. You've had an MRI. It's like trying to sleep in a metal trash can <laughs> while kids hit it with sticks. <laughs> but I didn't know this, right? So I'm, I'm flipping out, I'm in the, I get in the MRI, the first 30 seconds the machine just hums. You're in basically a tube, it's like a coffin, right? I'm just sitting there 
tr calming myself down, like, it's all right, you're gonna be okay, it's okay. The machine's just going, <laughs> like, you're gonna get through it, it's not a stroke or a heart attack. <laughs> It's like a fire alarm for your life. Like, ah, 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 you're gonna die. You're gonna die. You're gonna do a show in a converted mob strip club in Chicago. Ah, 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 ah. So I started doing yoga. Yeah, I know. I'm part of the problem. And before I talk about yoga, I just want to say this real quick about chronic back pain. The worst part about it, it's not the discomfort. It's everybody's stupid suggestions on how to make it better. <laughs> oh, you've had two, three years of chronic back pain? Have you tried a seat cushion? Oh, fuck, there it is, seat cushion, okay, yeah. No, oh, two years of doctors and chiropractors and physical therapy and hundreds of hours of my life and thousands of dollars, because even with insurance, we have a bullshit for-profit healthcare system. <laughs> doing all these tests with all these medical professionals with decades of combined education, training, and experience, and they all missed seat cushion. <laughs> Do you walk up to blind people and go, have you tried opening your eyes? <laughs> Let the light in. Just manifest it. <laughs> so I started doing yoga. And I love yoga. The first yoga class I went to, I was like, oh man, I could be a yoga teacher someday. <laughs> no way, there's no way I could ever be a yoga teacher. <laughs> Never in a million years. Because like I said, I'm a comic, everything's a joke, right? So if I was a yoga teacher, here's what I would do. I'd get everybody in class, I'd play that music, a ding, 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 ding. I'd be like, okay guys, this is your 60 minutes, this is your practice, okay? This is your time to connect mind, body, spirit, okay? Turn your phones off. Let go of everything you gotta do outside of the yoga studio. Your job, your family, your bills, your responsibilities. Let go that this is your time to reconnect with you, okay? Our first pose is gonna be the tree pose. This leg's gonna be our root. And you're gonna open up like this, and if you fall out, it's okay. It's not a competition. <laughs> then you're gonna raise your arms and lengthen like this, and you don't scrunch up your shoulders. We put so much stress and tension in our shoulders. We're in our cars, we're on our laptops, we're on our phones. Just lengthen and breathe, okay? I'm gonna piss in your mouth. <laughs> and remember, the second knuckle brings enlightenment. So remember. <laughs> and no one would question me as a teacher. They'd be in class like, did he just? <laughs> I heard it wrong. I'm crazy. <laughs> and that's how I know I could start a cult. <laughs> Thank you for, you know watching this the journey and you've, you've heard tonight you know i've i've gone through a lot of sort of transformations as a, as a person and one of them is i used to be a huge fan of the nfl i mean i like watching the nfl I like sports but i used to be a huge fan i i grew up watching it i played high school football at evanston i loved it i was like well, i was a bears fan you know i saw the bears win in 85 i was great you know but it's gotten you know as you wake up and you start paying attention to how the world works i get a little bummed out with the nfl man like they covered up CTE, the brain disease that pissed me off. They didn't give a shit about domestic violence and there was videos about it. They're like, oh, maybe we should do something about it. They, they, every, before the games, it's like a recruiting thing for war. I don't like wars, I told you. You know, they should have let Kaepernick take a goddamn knee. They should have let him take a knee, man. <laughs> they should have gone, we're America's game. He has a First Amendment right to take a knee. The people in the stands have a First Amendment right to boo him, cheer him, whatever. That's America's game. That's what they should have done and they didn't. It was bullshit. And I don't like a lot of their ads, man. A lot of their, I mean, their ads are all like, beer truck steak gun boobs, you know? <laughs> I mean, I like boobs, but not like angry, like boobs, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> the bacon wrapped flag truck boob gun, like bah. <laughs> so none of them are for me. Like I said, I'm a vegetarian, I meditate, I do yoga. I don't drink, I'm completely sober, I drive an electric car, I'm not making any of this shit up, man. <laughs> None of the ads are for me. I wish the NFL would make ads <laughs> for hippies like me, but still keep them NFL style. Like, hi, I'm Chicago Bears head coach, and when I'm making vegan smoothies for my team, <laughs> I use Blue Diamond almond milk. <laughs> Blue Diamond Almond Milk, the official organic unsweetened almond milk of the National Football League. <laughs> NFL, plant-based life. <laughs> 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 
the 2023 Nissan Leaf, the official zero emission vehicle of the National Football League. Plug it in, charge it up, and hit the open road. Up to 123 miles, then <laughs> charge for another two to three hours, charging may vary in your area, then hit the open road again. <laughs> Great for tailgating, yoga retreats, activist rallies. <laughs> NFL Green New Deal. <laughs> Nike and the National Football League want you to just manifest it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chicago. Strike. <laughs>